just to read this. Oh, here we go. Um, <laughs> so it's the science of interpretation, particularly of the scriptures and the branch of theology that deals with the principles of biblical exegesis. So that's kind of what we mean. Now, um, does anyone have any reflections on those definitions? Anything strike you about them at all? I guess I would have thought of interpretation as a science. Mm. Mm. I agree with Jen. Yeah, it's it feels like it's got to be, I mean, there's some logic to it, but I think there's got to be a personal inter interpretation or a personal relationship with that text as well. There's got to be some sort of a personal touch. And you, that's not really scientific because that's individual. Yeah, 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 for sure. Look, I, and I'm going to be honest with you, that's probably the word out of the whole, out of both of those definitions that I, that rubs against me the wrong way. Not mm. because I don't think hermeneutics should be rigorous. Of course, I, you know, I think it should be. But I think there's more to it than simply a kind of um, a, a process or a method. Um, there is actually a living element to it, as you say, Ray. Isn't in actual fact what you've got there a definition of exegesis, which is the science of interpretation, and hermeneutics is the wider picture, um, as I understand it, where then it becomes very personal. Well, thanks for stealing my thunder. No, no. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good question. It's a good point. So let's talk about that. Exegesis versus hermeneutics. What is the difference? And the part of the problem is that these terms get used interchangeably all the time. So somebody will talk about, you know, we've got to think about, um, you know, how we approach this exegetically. And what they're really talking about is their kind of philosophy of interpretation. Or they might say, well, you know, let's apply good hermeneutics as we read the scriptures this morning. And it's like, well, they, what, what does that mean? Are they talking about the act of interpretation itself or their theory of interpretation? So we kind of mix these, these terms up uh, very often. And then I've I just put a little note in there. Sometimes these terms get used quite strangely. So there's a very uh, uh, well-known and, and often used book called, I've got the picture there, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by uh, Gordon Fee and Doug Stewart. It's a, um, it, it was my textbook in my first year of Bible college, um, first semester of Bible college when I took my biblical interpretation class um, way back when, uh, way back when, I, you know, whatever. And um, uh, it gets used in colleges all over the place as a textbook. And their definition in that book for exegesis is discovering the, orig the original meaning of the text and at hermeneutics to mean finding the contemporary relevance of that text. Now, that might not seem strange if these are new terms for you, but in my view, that's actually a really odd kind of idiosyncratic way of looking at it. Uh, and they, they kind of say as much in the book, but it's become quite because the book has been so popular, looking at hermeneutics and exegesis like that has become reasonably popular. But here's my view. Oh, sorry, Margaret, were you going to say oh, something? I was just going to say that one of the ways I like to think about it is that exegesis is the task of looking at the text in its context, in its situ, where did it all happened way back and what it... Um, how we get to understand that using all the tools and then hermeneutics is bringing it into the 21st century. Well, that, that is very much what Fee and Stuart would say. Now, I disagree with that. And here's my view, right? And you can agree or disagree. Um, but unfortunately, we're going to be kind of proceeding on the assumption that I'm right. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's, You're allowed. Uh, you know, you can review it afterward. Um, so exegesis <laughs> is the task of interpretation itself. So the actual act of interpretation, right? And hermeneutics is the, the kind of the overarching theory, um, you know, principles or, or whatever of interpretation. So the, the one way to put it is that hermeneutics is the theory, exegesis is the practice. Now that's how I tend to think about it. So it's almost like, um, I saw, uh, a, 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 I once saw a, um, an analogy for this where um, exegesis is the game and hermeneutics is the rule book. 
Mm. Um, I think that gets used pretty commonly. And that's how I tend to think about it. Hermeneutics is kind of the overarching <laughs> philosophy of what we do in interpretation and exegesis is the act of doing it. Can I just interrupt at this point and ask a question? Yeah. Should we be affected when we're doing exegesis in human hermeneutics in, in modern science in the sense that uh, archaeology has shown that some of the things that have been described in the Bible either didn't occur or occurred in a very modified form. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking of the, the Exodus as, as a particular example of this. Yep. Where there's no archaeological evidence that, that a vast group of people traveled through the Sinai Desert to get to Israel. Yeah, yep. And so um, what, what's your question around that, Piers? How much should how much should scientific evidence, archaeological evidence in particular, have in how we interpret the passage that we're looking at? Well, that's, and that's a good question because it's going to depend on what method of reading you're using for the particular text. So let's um, maybe that's the next thing we're going to talk about. It will be. Let's come back. Can we car park uh, park that uh, question just for a sec? Because we will come back to that. I think, Piers. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and don't let me forget about it because it is, it's a really good question. Um, but I think it's going to come into some of the stuff we're going to discuss imminently. So, um, okay, let's flick over to exegesis to begin with. Right. So I've already talked about the fact that exegesis is the act of interpreting a text. And so if we want to talk about applying a text, what does it mean for our lives? This is a necessary step. We have to actually interpret the text. Now, I come from originally a Christian background that was fairly fundamentalistic. And the feeling within that kind of tribe was, I just read what's there. I just, it, I just read the Bible and it makes sense to me. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, they probably weren't reading Leviticus very often. But that aside, um, there was this sense that you don't actually interpretation and that doesn't that doesn't make sense i just read it and i understand what god is saying through the bible now that is deeply problematic because every act of reading is an act of interpretation in fact the, the before you even pick up the bible it's been interpreted for you to a certain extent because most of us are reading translations we're not reading the original texts in their original languages right and even then, you, you know, uh, you read the, if you get a Greek Bible, a Greek New Testament nowadays, um, it, it's a particular, they've made, all, they're, they've made particular choices for you because there's different manuscripts with slightly different, um, you know, versions. Um, and, and so even if you read a Greek Bible, you get the SBL Greek Bible, uh, it's, it's an interpretation to a, a certain extent. And so we're always interpreting when we read. And that's not just the Bible, that's any text we read. Um, you sit down and you read a newspaper. If, you know, I can't remember when I last read a newspaper it, as an actual newspaper, but anyway, uh, it, when, you know, we read a newspaper and on the front, there's a cover story. And we understand through experience that that cover story is incredibly important, right? It's the, it's the story that the paper wants us to see. Probably the, they think that we might buy the paper, excuse me, because of that story. And then you flick through the first few pages and you've got some editorial and maybe some opinion or whatever. And then you get to uh, the, I don't know, what other part of the paper you might get to. You get to the gossip column, right? And we, we know through, through reading that that's not the same as the opinion column or the cover story, right? We know from reading, uh, from experience, that we should read those differently. And we bring different eyes to the gossip column. Not that I'm expecting anyone here reads the gossip column. But, or, you know, the sports page or the racing guide. The racing guide is probably not a good example either. Um, so, <laughs> uh, the comics, right? Or the crossword. We know that we ought to read those all differently. We don't read them all the same. Uh, and so, we're, what we're doing when we do that is interpreting. We're interpreting the genre of those 
pieces. We're interpreting their, maybe their purpose or, or et cetera. So here's a question for you. And I want you to take this into breakout groups. Or two questions, I should say. What do you think is the ultimate aim of exegesis, of the act of interpretation? And then second, when we exegete a text, to what kinds of things do we need to pay attention? What do we need to be looking at, looking for? What will affect the way we interpret that we need to make sure that we're taking into account? Okay. Now, these questions aren't going to accompany you to your breakout room, unfortunately. So, um, if you can just take note of them briefly, and um, and John will send you in in, an, in just a second. Um, five minutes. What did you What did you say? What did you talk about? We actually talked about in our group the fact that there are significant differences between the various churches, and they must all um, do exegesis. Um, but obviously, they come up with very different views of the text. Yeah. Um, and we were starting to get, I guess, bogged down on that. Um, so we moved on to number two then and, and had a look at um, uh, what we need to pay attention to. Um, and it was the culture, both um, the historical culture and the actual way the people operated. And the second one was the, the genre. What else, my group? Uh, intended audience. Yes, that was good, important. Yes. And the meaning of words. Mm. Yes. 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 Yeah. But, I mean, I guess we are concerned. I wrote to John and he hasn't replied, but are concerned with... Oh, yes. The, <laughs> the, the position where you, you so become so aware of the unreliability, in a sense, of the scriptures, that what do you, how, how do you put so much weight on any text that you've interpreted mm. when the, 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 the whole of the scriptures been seen as fairly unreliable in lots of ways? Mm. Yeah, well, uh, unreliable by a kind of a uh, enlightenment and post enlightenment standard of history, right? That's what we mean when we say that, isn't it? I'm not sure. I mean, when we get to the point where there's no exodus, um, <laughs> you, you, that it's got a much wider application than just post um, enlightenment. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it's impossible for us to look at these, look, look at the, you know, interpretation as any anyone but people who have been shaped by the Enlightenment, right? I mean, that's the world that we all inhabit, and we we necessarily look at things through that lens with all its biases, all its values, um, and the Bible. And, you know, all the texts in the Bible, because it's not one book, obviously, as you already know. And it was written with none of that stuff in mind, none of those values, none of those concerns. And I think it is important to meet it on its own terms rather than um, us trying to wrestle it into something that it was mm -hmm. never written as. Yeah. So, um, look, I, 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 I'm going to make an assumption here, but do feel free to tell me that I'm wrong if, if I am. When we look at, say, Genesis 1 and 2, right, the creation narratives, I suspect that for most Uniting Church people, we wouldn't take those as literal or literalistic, I should say, literalistic um, statements of scientific fact about how the world was actually, you know, made. Is that... Yeah, it's not that kind of genre. Right, it's descriptive. Right descriptive genre narr a, a narrative so definitely not I, I i put it very carefully just because if you know if anybody does disagree with that i want to <laughs> like make the room for you but i would strongly disagree with the other perspective the, the, the genesis was written um the, look there's a whole bunch of layers to it but one major layer for example 
is that it's written as a counter narrative to the Babylonian creation story, Enuma Elish, and other creation stories of in the ancient Near East, but that's the one I'm most familiar with. Um, and in that story, uh, the gods basically go to war with each other. It's a long sort of epic tale, but the result is that when Marduk kills his mother, Tiamat, he sort of rips her in half uh, and crushes the skull and all this kind of stuff. And all her entrails and blood is, is the basis of the world. That's how the world is made out of all that violence and blood. And then when uh, the losing gods in the war whinge that because they've been enslaved and when they whinge that we don't want to do this work anymore um marduk has them killed and then out of their blood humans are created to replace them as slaves right to do all the work that the god you know marduk and his gods the other gods on his don't want to do now imagine the world that imagine how you would see the world if that's your creation story human beings are literally created out of divine violence in order to be slaves and to serve uh the king who is kind of like the um the the almost like the the image of god right and then uh, genesis comes along and says well the world wasn't created out of like the entrails of uh dismembered uh, gods it's just created out of words like oh god, god. God speaks and, and the world is created or uh, humans aren't created out of uh, the blood of uh, whinging gods. Uh, it, humans are created just, you know, out of the dirt, out of, out of creativity and, and, and love as we would read it back into that story. Right. Um, and the, the, every human uh, is made in the image of God from the beginning, not just the king. So, you know, you don't have two classes of human being, blah, 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 right? This is what the story is trying to do. It's not trying to tell us a story of how the world was scientifically created because that was not really a concern until the modern period. It's a much gentler approach, isn't it? Yeah. You know, the, the Genesis one to the other one, the violence that was created, that created the humans and the world. Yeah. You yep. almost say that's where we get the violence from now but it's a much gentler approach to everything. Yeah, it's a primeval story that doesn't involve violence. And yes. Yeah. There's something mm. in that, right? Mm. Uh, yes. But the point is the text is doing something in its own time and that we can, we can investigate that and go, what does that mean for our time? On the, but, but when we wrestle it into going, well, we are concerned with questions of how the world was made, this text needs to talk about that. When we try to fit it into that box, we do violence to the text, you know? Mm. And now that's an easier one because we probably already came to this uh, unit of study uh, going, yeah, we agree with that, right? But the Exodus one is more challenging because it, it does buck against our, uh, our assumptions about what the text yes. might be doing. And what that means is we, if we genuinely believe that scripture in some sense uh, conveys the authority of God over us. Um, we we go. Oh, how do we get in line with what Scripture is actually doing? Um, and is it trying to tell a historical story about a guy named Moses who led it? Well, maybe it's not doing that. Maybe it's telling that story for another purpose. And it doesn't mean it's any less true. It just means it's historically not different. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's um, a bit of a tangent uh, from what we're talking about. So. Uh, why don't we um, continue? Uh, anyone else have anything that any other group uh, have anything different they'd like to say? Matt, Matt, yeah, can you just go a little bit further with that because it <laughs> that's a real. I mean, the story of Exodus. I mean, it, it's picked up so much in the Christ story mm. that I yeah. find saying it didn't exist very trauma traumatic for me okay yeah um so could you s talk a little bit further on it because it yeah it yeah so say i mean even 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 as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the son of man be lifted up i mean th th there's prophecy there's there's so much there mm. that is to me an important part of the message of christianity um that I have great difficulty with 
saying it doesn't exist, particularly when there's very little archaeological evidence for any of Egyptian history at all. So to, to say as an argument, the exodus probably didn't occur because there's no archaeological evidence or little to even suggest it, um, would be to counteract the fact that there's very little to suggest any Egyptian history back that t at that time. Yeah, I mean, we there's certainly much more, though, as regards Egypt than there is for any, you know, the exodus has exactly zero. <laughs> Um, and it, the, for Egypt, we do have quite a bit, even if it's not, you know, the same as we might have for something that happened 200 years ago, you know. Uh, but look, the meaning of the meaning of texts and the meaning of stories doesn't necessarily, for ancient people, in, uh, concern itself with whether they actually happened. And it's quite possible, in fact, quite likely, that people living in Jesus's time did think it actually happened because how would they how would they know otherwise there is no way for them to know i mean you could tell stories about my great grandfather and i would have no idea whether they actually happened right um mm -hmm. and the same would go for these ancient people they, they there's no reason for them to um doubt that they might have actually happened uh, so that that is a layer there but the meaning of the stories doesn't really, it, it, it doesn't rely on the historicity of those, of those things actually having happened because they are still Holy Scripture, whether or not they actually happen. They are still stories that shape how we see the world in the same way that we have stories like, now these might not shape our uh, lives as much nowadays, but they certainly were part of the lore of, of our uh, societies that came before us, stories like King Arthur or Robin Hood, right? These are stories that almost certainly um, didn't, I mean, they didn't happen as they're, as they're told. They might be, then maybe they were based on something historical that happened um, as, as a starting point, but they didn't happen as they're told. Now, if I say, look, I'm going to um, rob, the, rob the rich, give to the poor, as an analogy for maybe redistributing wealth, the power of that analogy doesn't, uh, it doesn't rely on the historicity of the Robin Hood story. No. I'm using the symbol of that story to say, this is giving meaning to what I'm doing. And I don't think that, look, this is me, right? But I don't think that Jesus say, you know, Moses holding up uh, the serpent in the wilderness. I don't think what he's saying is this has to have actually happened historically for it to have any meaning now. I think what he's saying is I'm calling back to this story in order to make sense of what I'm doing. Now. Yeah, can I add a little comment there, Matthew? Hmm. I think that one of the things that we have to appreciate is what you said, is what, what the people, the writers of the New Testament based their whole faith uh, system on is what we need to understand to be able to interpret what they're talking about and so we need to look if we're going to talk about the the truth of exodus we need to look at its overarching themes not its miniature of of detail of how many people there were or anything else it's about what are the themes that then go through the whole of scripture and into the new testament you know like themes of bondage and liberation and freedom that's the easter story as well so it's, it's picking up the major themes rather than the miniature of the story to see how it connects um, to the New Testament and to us now. You know, Can I just make one quick comment? Yeah. The big, the big question that I've been asking lately is what shaped Christianity, the events or the stories about the events? Say that again. Stories about the events. Did the events, the events, or the stories of the events shape Christianity? I think it was the stories. I think yeah. it's both. I think yeah. it's both. Both. <laughs> there had to be something happened. Yes. I, I don't. The, we're, we're pretty far down a rabbit hole at the moment, and, and I don't want to mm. go too far down. Partly because you've still got plenty of weeks where these kind of things can be tossed around, and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and talked about right so you know um but uh, 
I guess what I'd say is it depends on the story because there are certain stories that I think the historicity of those stories does actually matter. I think whether Jesus actually died on a cross in history, I, I think that matters, right? Yeah. I yes. don't think it's the same for the Exodus and there's a, there's different reasons for that. Um, but, you know, I guess what we need to, when we're talking about different texts and this relates to what we're talking about here, we actually have to think about um what is that particular text doing? We can't actually apply a universal rule to the 66 books of scripture and the Apocrypha if you want to read those. Um, th there is no universal rule, um, or there's very few anyway, um, that you can apply. We actually have to look at everything in its, you know, in its own context, in, in its own, uh, within itself and the, the world around it to go, what is it actually trying to do? For me, it's pretty clear that the gospel well, yeah, it's reasonably clear anyway, that the gospel authors are trying to tell a story that is based in history, even if um, it's, it differs on various points, um, but they're talking about things that did actually happen. And that has, for me at least, theologically, certain uh, thing, you know, there's importance attached to that for a variety of reasons that we can't really get into uh, today. Look, I want to move on. Um, and to say this sort of flows in what we've been talking about. There's not only one way or one correct way to read the Bible or to interpret the Bible. There is a range of ways to do it. And in biblical studies, uh, academic studies, that is, there is sort of, there's some broad groupings of approaches to reading. We're going to go through these. And what I want to say up front is you don't need to remember all this. I'm not expecting you to remember all these methods or to know how to do them well, okay? Because I don't, I'm pretty sure John doesn't, uh, maybe he does, but <laughs> um, no, there is no scholar that I know of who is, who is a master of all these different ways of reading because it's just too much. We all tend to specialize in different things and to choose a few that really work for us and we use them. <clears throat> but knowing that there are all these other ways of reading is I think really important. So let's just quickly go through some of these. The first grouping is called the historical critical methods. Now, this is the method that, this is pretty common in the Uniting Church, right? For Uniting Church people, often what we're trying to do is uncover the original meaning of the text. Yeah? What were the original people saying? What were they trying to do? As far as we can work that out, because you know we're not in the heads of the original authors, um, so we don't really know what they're thinking, but we try to work that out on the basis of, the, uh, of, of what they wrote. And there's different uh, particular methods. Now, you'll notice the word criticism used a lot here. That doesn't mean it's people going, oh, this sucks. Like, <laughs> what did he... It's criticism in, this, in the sort of um, the German tradition of saying, just applying critical methods to it, just applying critical thinking to it, basically, Okay. So there's some different methods here that gets used, and these all come under the umbrella of historical critical methods. So textual criticism, for example, is it's, it's pretty much for people who know the original languages. It, it is for people who know the original languages. And this is where you get the different manuscripts that exist, and you try to work out on the basis of comparing them and bringing them together what the original text said in its original language. It's a... Simple as that. This is crucial, for example, for translating the Bible. You need to know what the original language text might have said. So that's what textual criticism is about. Form criticism is about going, well, what forms did the stories that we've got in scripture originally have? Were they oral stories that got passed down? Were they written down? Um, if you've done the New Testament course, you've probably looked at, you know, that there's... <laughs> The, the widespread theory that Matthew used Mark and this saw other source called Q and, and a third source that we call M. They're hypothetical names because we don't know them. Um, but what form did Matthew take, right? And then you've got source criticism, which is somewhat similar. What's, what were the sources of the, um, of the text? And so, again, with Matthew, Q, Mark, M, Luke used Q and Mark and L. And, and what were the sources that uh, came to make the text that we have as it is? 
Redaction criticism is mainly in gospel studies and particularly synoptic studies, that is uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where you compare the stories and you, and you compare where they tell the same story and look at the, mainly the differences and the similarities and work out what does that tell us about the theology of, say, Matthew or Mark or Luke? What were they trying to do by telling that story in a certain way? Right? You can do this with John occasionally as well. Like, for example, why does John put the J- Jesus clearing the temple? Why does he put that in chapter two of his book where for the other gospels, it's at the end. What, what does that say about what the, you know, what John is doing differently from the other gospel writers? Okay. So that's redaction criticism. <clears throat> Grammatical crit- criticism is what Bruce said before, just things like the meaning of words and the meaning of phrases and kind of basic things like that. Uh, and then socio-historical criticism is where you're just looking at the social history around the text. You know, what, what's going on at the time of Jesus when the Gospels, when, when he does his ministry and what's going on around Mark when he writes his Gospel or, you know, whoever wrote the Gospel. And that, so these methods basically are all forms of trying to work out what's behind the text. What is the original meaning, that kind of thing. Okay. Next group of methods are called literary methods. Now, these methods are very different because they're not particularly, for the most part, interested in historical questions. They're interested in the text as we have it in its final form. So they're not interested in whether Matthew used Mark's gospel. For the most part, it's not a concern. We just, we have Matthew, so we read Matthew as literature. And so you've got different forms of this, right? Narrative criticism is where you look at different elements of story and bring that into interpreting. Um, So what's the plot? Um, What's the setting? Who are the characters? What are the, you know, and you study all these kinds of things. So you study it as a story. You have rhetorical criticism where you look at the, the, uh, the methods of persuasion that we used by the authors. So you might read Paul's letters and go, oh, so here Paul uses a kind of argument from the lesser to the greater, you know, well, if Moses did this, how much more so if, if Christ has done this and he moves from one, and that would have been convincing to the people who wrote, uh, who read his letter. So what methods of persuasion did they use in, in their uh, writings? Intertextual analysis is where you kind of just compare different texts so you might take um, Matthew's story of the clearing of the temple, for example, and you'll look at, well, what, why does Jesus quote from Isaiah and Jeremiah in that? And then you'll look at those texts and go, what are they saying there? How do we bring those texts together to make sense of what Matthew's doing? So you kind of look intertextually between texts. Uh, and canonical criticism is, in short, where you look at, the text within the canon of scripture. So for example, the book of revelation is at the end of our canon. Why is it at the end? What is it? Why is that important? What is it doing as the final book? You know, you look at those kinds of questions. Everyone with me. Okay. Yeah. This is not the most exciting thing in the world, but I want you to understand that there's very different ways that we can read. Sociological methods are um, focused, as the name suggests, on sociological concerns and in particular on sociological theories. And so they will apply social scientific theories to scripture um, to work out what might have been going on. So it's, it's quite historical, but it uses social science as a tool. And so, for example, you, you have people like Bruce Maliner who have written books on you know, using this kind of method where they'll talk about things like um, honor and shame. They'll apply the concept of the social, the, the social scientific theory of honor and shame to scripture because people who lived in Palestine in the first century lived in an honor shame culture. So they use what we've learned from honor and shame uh, societies that exist now and in, re- in recent history and apply what we've learned back into the, the biblical text to help us understand. And they do that with all sorts of theories that I'm not really qualified to explore because I'm not a social scientist. So, uh, And then also socio-historical 
criticism, uh, which I described before, just basically describing what is going on socially and culturally around the, you know, in the time of the text. Okay, then you've got ideological methods. Now, these are very much focused on the lens that the reader brings to the text. So they're not particularly, they're not particularly concerned with the history of Isaiah or Titus or, you know, whatever, whatever book. They're not particularly uh, concerned, no, not, not necessarily concerned with it as literature. They're, it, uh, they're primarily concerned with reading it through a particular lens. Um, and that might be a particular social or identity-based location. So, for example, I've got examples there. Empire or imperial criticism, where you look at the Bible and read it through the lens of um, thinking about empire, uh, imperialism, colonialism, you know, whatever it might be. You might have feminist approaches. So you're reading the text with um, a feminist critique in mind, thinking about what do these texts say to women and patriarchy and these kind of things. Liberationist approaches, this um, sort of began in South America in the 70s, but thinking about reading the Bible from a position of marginalization and poverty and domination, these kind of things. Um, and, and kind of coming out of that, in a sense, you've got like black interpretation or queer interpretation or... Um, You've got like Korean approaches, Min, Min Yung approaches to scripture, or um, in India, you've got Dalit or untouchable approaches to the Bible, readings by Dalit peoples. Um, so, you know, you name it, it can be done, right? <laughs> this is just a sampling of some methods, but essentially it's people saying, we're going to read this Bible, we're going to read the scriptures as this group to see what it has to say to our particular moment and our particular identity and our particular social location. And Can you explain what you mean by queer approaches? Is it what I think you mean? Yeah, so LGBTI yeah. Um, sort of uh, lens of reading. Yeah. Um, Don't you think that's a terrible um, way of expressing it? Uh, what? Sorry, what do you mean by that? Well, queer, to refer to the L, the, the, that community as queer to me is quite shocking. Uh, well, they use the word for themselves. That's why you get LGBTIQ, Q is queer. So yeah, um, yeah, I, that's, that's a word that they use for, the, for their own community. It was originally a slander, um, but the, the, queer, the queer community took it on and went, well, we're gonna take that word and use it how we wanna use it, so. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> that's all right. And then finally, or the last one I'm going to look at anyway, is what, this is a broad group. It's called, often known as spiritual or theological reading. <laughs> now, this is a group, uh, I'll just read what's on the slide. It's a group of approaches um, uh, ha uh, has in common, it should say, a commitment to reading scripture sacramentally, that is, as pointing to Christ and making God present. Now, we might say, oh, surely the Bible you know, we are always doing that when we're reading the Bible. Um, it does this in a particular way. Um, and it, it tends to be the approach that to reading the Bible that you get, for example, in the patristics in the, uh, you know, what are known as the early church fathers. Um, and they tended to read the Bible as a sacrament, as something that God had given in God's grace and that makes God known. And they took that very seriously so that when they read passages, they don't necessarily, they, they, they have a, they, they, they read the literal reading of the text and they think that's important, but they also think there's a deeper spiritual meaning to the text. And so when, for example, they read the story of, um, well, a famous example is Gregory of Nyssa reads um, the story of the angel of death passing over and leaving the Jews uh, and, and killing the firstborn sons of the Egyptians, right? Now, he reads that story and says, well, at a he thinks at a literal level, it's problematic because it, it's quite an immoral act uh, to just wipe out people indiscriminately. So he says there must be a deeper spiritual meaning to that story. And he thinks the deeper spiritual meaning is that uh, Christ is, 
uh, it's actually an allegory for Christ overcoming the power of sin. Now, that sounds a bit wacko to us, right? We look at that and go, oh, yeah, that it seems a bit arbitrary and random. But there are actually rules for it. It is actually a pretty sophisticated approach to scripture that just doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense in our particular worldview and, and historical period. To be honest, it's something that I'd like to see us as Protestants, especially recover a bit more. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done before we ever get to that point. Um, typological reading is similar where you see types in the Old Testament and see them fulfilled often in the New Testament. And so the suffering servant in Isaiah 40, uh, 42 or 43 rather um, is a type, uh, you know, and Christ sort of is a fulfillment of that in a sense. You see things like this. Okay. So there, that's a long rant about um, different ways of reading, but I think it's important to know that there is a, you know, there's this diversity in reading. So here's three questions for you, right? This is, we're going to give you 10 minutes in your groups to do this. Which approaches do you find yourself drawn towards and why? Would different approaches be more appropriate for different types of biblical texts? Can you, can you think of an example? Like where would you go? Or maybe that one isn't a good example. Uh, it's, it's not a good one to use. So for ex- let me give you an example just to make this clear. Narrative criticism, where you read it a text as a story, looking at like plot and setting and characters and n- narrator, that kind of thing. It's maybe not a good approach to reading Paul's letters because Paul's letters aren't a story. So there's an example. And then finally, which approach might you use to read those texts? Now, don't go through all four. Just choose one of those four texts, Genesis 1 to 3, Psalm 23, 1 Kings as a whole book, or Proverbs as a whole book. Which approaches do you think you might use? Now, again, don't feel like you need to remember all 25 or so of the approaches I just outlined. Um, just roughly speaking, you know, do, should you use a historical approach? Should you use a literary approach? You know, what might be, what might work? Okay. What was the third passage? Uh, first Kings. Okay. And then the final one was Proverbs. So just choose one of those passages or books that I've, or another one, you know, I don't care. Like if, you, <laughs> if you want to do a different one uh, and, and argue about it in your group, feel free. But you've only got 10 minutes, so you do have to get a bit of a move on with these questions. You won't be able to talk for too much uh, at length on each one. Uh, All right, I'll stop sharing so that John can put you in groups. Has everyone written that down? Is that going to work for everyone? Welcome back, everybody. That was quick. (laughs) Sure. Well, that just goes to show how good it is to be talking about some of this. (coughs) Time flies. Yeah. Help me to realize I'm talking to smart people here. It's fantastic. (laughs) Good. Well, uh, speaking of smart people, what have you got to say about the questions? (laughs) (laughs) I I think you've you've sold us a a a crook uh, theory because it sounded really good when you're explaining all the different ways of doing it, but when we came to apply it, we, we were, you know, uh, I think it could be this with a bit of that thrown in and, and the other approach is pretty good too. So we, we, we had trouble narrowing it down. And I think that's part of the problem, isn't it, that we want to use one method when really we need to have a bit of an idea of all of them because everything we read is not the same. And I was relating... Different. Yeah, to to the group that I was in, how I discovered when we started doing a bit of the um, social context of the parables, the difference it makes in understanding the parables when you see them in the context of um, the um, guilt and shame culture and the power the parables have when you see them, read them like that. Mm is incredible and 
my last word was I found at the older I'm getting, I find this stuff so exciting because it opens up such enormous, um, a deeper understanding of the scriptures altogether. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> well, yeah, and it's not so much that um, I know you phrase it like this uh, hypothetically rather than your own opinion, um, but it's not so much that it's a problem that we have all these methods, it's that we get to use all these methods. That's right. Um, um, you know, there's all these different ways of reading that the, and even one, even if you ch chose one, say, chapter of the Bible and you spent all your life reading that chapter and you, used all of these methods and you did a master's thesis on that chapter using every method, right? Uh, you did 25 master's theses all using a different method. You would still not exhaust the meaning of the text. Yeah. And that's why we still have the Bible and that's why it's still important in our lives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think in our, in our group earlier, we were saying how you don't need to have one answer. And I, I really enjoy people talking about a text where they pose some different ways that you might be thinking about that text. Yeah. Uh, and leave and, you and leave you with some of those, you know, here's a door you might look through and here's another door. Um, and 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 to find to me that's really interesting. I don't want I don't need one, only one answer. Yeah. And there would be people who would respond to what you just said, Kate, and say, Oh, well that, you know, um, th that sounds like relativism, you know, where yes, there's right. no truth and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and it's to say, uh, no, 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 it's not relativism. It's just saying that the truth is big, right? Yeah. Um, it's not relativism. We don't just get to make it up. We don't just get to say whatever we want. There are actually uh, things that we can, that we say are not true. Um, uh, things that we say are false uh, or whatever, but we, this allows us, <laughs> To, to realize that the truth is big why well because god is big mm, <laughs> you know mm. um so mm. yeah yep we're going to move on uh as you you know you may have realized that when i asked for answers i really don't care what the questions were <laughs> just interested in what your reflections were so uh, <laughs> um the question is just there to get you thinking about things so uh, I've already said this, um, but just to quickly go over it again, a layperson or even an academic should not be expected to master all the aforementioned reading methods. Biblical scholars themselves generally specialise in only one or a few. Um, for the most part, having a basic knowledge of the background of a passage and the context in which you're reading will allow you to read pretty well. So just to say, you don't, the point of this is not to master it. The point again, as I've said, is to realise how much we can do with the Bible. Can I ask a question, Matthew, there? Yeah. Um, so a lot of that would depend on what commentaries we're using or what, what resources we have. Yeah, for sure. Um, and there are, there, are good there are great resources, there are good resources, there are not so good resources, there are awful resources out there. Um, so this is the kind of thing... Uh, that makes community really important for you to be around other uh, Christians and particularly, uh, particularly connected with people like John and Elizabeth, who, if you go, look, I want to read the book of Jude, um, uh, wh wh what do I do? And they might Don't. have to, Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> what did you say? Don't. Don't. <laughs> well, you no, don't do. answer. Or Romans, you know. Uh, <laughs> yes. Romans. <laughs> but, you know, if you said you wanted to read a book, you can ask them, what are some good resources around that? And yep. even if they don't know off the top of their head, they can go away and have a look and have a think and they will be able to help you to, to find some good ones because, you know, there are there are some awful ones out there. And there are, and the, there are some they are going to say, this is how you read it. This is the only way to read it. You know, that's it. And that's not a helpful approach. So, look, we're going to just talk a, very briefly about a step-by-step -step guide of exegesis. This is not the way to do exegesis. This is a way to do it. But I think this is one helpful guide for doing it as lay people. That is, you know, it's pretty reliable. And so those steps are read and reflect on the text. This is the, 
most important thing, right? Often forgotten. People sit down to maybe write a sermon or whatever, and they just get into writing something. Well, read the text, <laughs> sit down with it, read it slowly, read it again slowly, and sit and have a think about it. That's a good starting point. <laughs> so step two, look at the text's contexts, especially the literary and historical context. So what is the his historical context of this text? What is going on around it that might be important? What does the text talk about that relates to its historical setting? What, who might the audience be? Who might the writer be and why are they writing to this audience? What problem are they trying to confront? If it's a problem, maybe it's not a problem. Maybe it's something else. And then the literary context is asking questions like, what is the genre of this text? Is this trying to tell a history? And if it is, what, what do they mean by history? Is it like an exact uh retelling of events like we mean like we generally mean by history or is it something different ancient people thinking about it differently or if it's not a history is it a is it a story is that story meant to be what we might call myth or um creative you know like a novel or is is it not a story at all is it a letter uh etc is it a proverb is it a song a poem what is it uh, if it's a story, what happened? If I'm preaching from this a certain chapter, what happened before this chapter? If it says therefore, what what is the therefore therefore? What what is going on? Therefore, I tell you. Well, what did you say before that makes means that you've got to tell me this? You know, these are the kind of questions you can ask with regard to literary context. Okay, three, look at the form and structure of the text. I've kind of covered this a little bit already, actually. Um, but what kind of text is it? What kind of story or point, is, what kind of story is it telling or what kind of point is it making? Um, you know, the structure of the text, does it have particular scenes or stages that you can sort of look through and see what's going on? Uh, is it a letter? You know, if it's a letter, is this the beginning of the letter? Is it the end of the letter? What, what does that mean? Um, so on and so forth. Yeah. All right, step four. Look closely at what the text is communicating. What is the point being made? What is the argument, if you will, in the text? We don't often carry this through. This is why... So many people are so bad at reading the book of Romans, for example, because they read chapters of it and go, oh, well, you know, it's talking about how sinful everyone is and therefore we need, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, maybe it is, but what, what is the argument that it's making throughout? I think John would tell you probably in even stronger terms than me that this is why there's so much bad reading of Romans 9 to 11, for example, because we don't know yeah, if you're not familiar with that text off the top of your head, that's fine. But it's a text where Paul wrestles with what does it mean for God to be faithful to the Jewish people? And you get a lot of really quite anti-Semitic readings of that text with Christians because they don't follow the argument from the beginning. Um, okay, so... Follow, you know, what is the text communicating? What argument is it making? Uh, five, draw conclusions. Bring, draw all the threads together. Just bring everything together because then step six is interpret for your context. What does it mean for us? Trying to be faithful to the text. Acknowledging that it's not just your personal experience either. You've got to look at it for, through everyone's experience. So let me give you an example of this, right? I'm reasonably fond of a particular reading uh, of Matthew 5, 38 to 42 by a guy named Walter Wink, right? That's the text where Jesus says, if someone turns to you there, uh, if, if someone slaps you on your, let me get this right, left cheek, uh, turn to them your right cheek as well. Is that right? No. No, right. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to your, your left as well. Oh. Um, 
And what what Wink says about that, this is New Testament, obviously, uh, not Old Testament, but it's a helpful example anyway. And what Wink says about that text is it's actually a way to uh, confront violence and uh, injustice rather than uh, to be a doormat. It's not about just saying, yeah, slap me again and do whatever you want. He thinks it's about saying, uh, for a variety of socio, socio, socio-historical reasons, it's standing up against the oppressor in a non-violent way. I won't get into the details, but the problem, you know, that's fine as an as understanding of the text in its context. But when you bring that into your own context, what you don't want to be saying is, for example, if you're in a situation of domestic violence, just cop it as a way to stand against the injustice. That is maybe not a good way to apply that text, yeah? Um, and so we have to think about the experiences of others in our community when we apply a text, not just our own or our own, you know, try to avoid just our narrow perceptions about our own community. Because we, 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 we only experience our community as ourselves and we try to, we, we need to think more broadly than ourselves when we apply, if you're preaching, for example. Okay. Are there any questions about that? Hopefully it's pretty straightforward. Um, Do we have time for this? Let's come back to this if we have time. Let's just keep going for a sec. Just to switch over to hermeneutics briefly. So remember I said exegesis is the active interpretation. Hermeneutics is the theory of interpretation. Now, we all have a philosophy of reading and interpreting even if we don't realize that we do. In the 20th century, particularly with continental philosophy, you see a massive shift in our understanding of interpretation. We have this realization that we all have a horizon. What does that mean? It means that there are limits to our perception. When you stand in a place, you have a horizon, a a, a place where you can't see beyond, right? You have a limit to how far you can see because of where you're standing. And if you, move your, if you move your position, your horizon will be different. You'll see some different things. You'll not see some, you, you'll lose sight of some other things. And so we all have these horizons, right? Um, and in the 20th century, that became a lot, that, that came to the forefront. It became far more um, a conscious thing for us as people thinking about how we interpret. Um, and so our, our experience necessarily <laughs> shapes how we read. You just can't escape the fact that you will read as whoever you are. I always read the Bible as a pretty affluent, white, straight bloke who's married, um, has kids now, um, is, is pretty well educated. You know, like that is my background. I can't read the Bible as a poor black African woman. I can be aware of that and pay attention to how a poor black African woman might read the scriptures. Maybe by listening to them, for example. But reading is a participatory event. You know, we're, we're not neutral, we're not unbiased, um, we're not passive. Now, for some reason, that picture is way smaller than when I initially put it into the slide. So please forgive me for that. But this is a way to illustrate what we're doing when we read scripture hermeneutically. It's called the hermeneutical spiral. And what it's basically just illustrating there, if you can't read the text, is that you read the Bible, you, you read the text, you know, whatever text you're reading, And it changes you in some way. You learn something from it. It changes your habits, maybe. I don't know, whatever it does, but it transforms you in some way. And then as a transformed person, you go back and you read the text and you read it differently. And then by reading the text, you get transformed. And then you go back to the text as a transformed person and you read it differently and you read the text and and so on and so on. This is the hermeneutical spiral. This is the relationship we have with scripture. We read it, it transforms us and transforms how we read it, which transforms us and so on and so forth. 
<clears throat> you can also uh, picture this as a circle or in my case, four boxes uh, in a loop, whatever. And um, so <laughs> and this is, it's the same thing. Uh, we assess our current understanding. Think about how do we understand things at the moment? Then we read and we interpret individual parts doing exegesis. And then we, th we think about that part within the whole. How do we, we just read a story and we interpreted it. How does that fit into the whole story? How does that fit into the way we see things? And that transforms us, which then causes us to assess our current understanding. And, you know, we just keep going around the circle. Now, <clears throat> the reason I prefer the spiral as a analogy is because it signifies movement and growth and change. It doesn't, you just, you don't keep coming back to the same place. Uh, so I like the symbol better, but they basically do the same thing. So that's kind of just a few things about hermeneutics that are helpful and how we think that we have, we always participate, we are transformed and we can use that to our advantage rather than as something negative. And rather than going, woe is us, we always read as people who, um, you know, have a horizon. We can't see everything. Oh no, no, we go, all right, well, let's channel that into something good. Let's go back to putting this into use. Uh, how many breakout groups are there, by the way? Is it two or three? Three? Three. Okay. Three. Let's do the first three of these texts. <clears throat> um, what I'd like you to do is go back into your group just for, you know, seven minutes or so. Uh, so group one, do Genesis one, just verse one. Uh, group two, Leviticus 25 verses one to seven. Group three, Psalm uh, 137. And I want you just to very briefly go through the step-by-step -step guide that I gave you with that text and see what comes out the other side. Um, but hopefully um, it was a worthwhile uh, process because we're not going to get you to feedback now. We're at the end of our time. Um, but I just wanted to quickly ask even while we're a few minutes over time, if anyone has any burning questions that they want to ask before we wrap up. How can we live in the 21st century? What was the question? Sorry. How can we possibly live in the 21st century? I want to talk about that over lunch, uh, Patricia. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Look, I, I, I go to, I go on Facebook and I wonder that every day. Just <laughs> yes. so, um, you asked a question in the beginning and I said, you've got to be true to yourself. Yes. And you said you agree and you disagree and you, uh -huh. and you just left us hanging. Yes. No, I won't sleep. Uh, and now, and now I'm, I, I confess I'm struggling to remember what you meant by that again. So I'm going to have to ask you, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you, you said you have to be happy with your efforts or something like that in interpretation. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Like you can interpret it. But, but but you have to be comfortable with that interpretation yourself. Yeah, right. There no, has to I, be integrity. Yeah, I confess I can't remember what I was thinking when I when I said what I said. Uh, but I guess what I would say is that um, we we do need to be careful that we don't get over comfortable with uh, our methods mm. and such that they lock us into reading the text in a certain way. Um, because the text is alive. It is, it is the word of God. Um, however, we mean that, right? Okay. But it is, or, it, you know, it contains the word of God, I think is the Uniting Church's language. Um, uh, or in it, we hear the word of God, I think is the Uniting we Church. Language. Um, but uh, <clears throat> however we articulate that, we hear the word of God in it. And that word does all sorts of things to us and they're not always comfortable. I think that's the thing, right? Yes. Um, so True. that's probably my main caveat there. But it's a good, but I don't disagree with you, uh, Bruce. Um, I just want to nuance it slightly. Yeah. And uh, Piers, did we get to your question sufficiently uh, as we talked about exegesis? Your question about I think, I think you did answer it, but uh, it's still a big problem as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, yes. I mean, how, how science may affect our reading of things uh, is a big deal. I, I probably would want to say, as a student of not just theology, but philosophy, I'd want to also acknowledge that science isn't monolithic. Uh, science isn't straightforward. And what science says is not always, um, it's not always clear. So I'm not, this is not an anti-science rant. It's just to say that science is often a matter of interpretation too. The data is the data. I get that. Um, but how we understand that data and understand the world in relation to it is not always clear. Right. Even scientific facts has to be interpreted. Yes, that's right. Um, but it doesn't take away from what you said, Piers, that it is deeply complicated um, how science and, say, biblical interpretation relate. We're going to have to leave it there, though. Um, thanks for having me. It's been lovely. And um, hopefully this has been a worthwhile hour and a, hour and a half or so. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Very much. Thank you. Thanks, Matt.